We can we can cope with that. Mm. There we go. Um, right. Good afternoon, Alex. Afternoon. How are you doing? What is it? Sunday afternoon, four o'clock. Something around that. We just had the emergency alert, um, which is good fun. <laughs> as a, as a, I did, you know, practicing putting up my tent for next weekend for a weekend away. And it did get me thinking as why do we suddenly need an emergency alert? What, what emergency is the government planning for that we don't quite know yet? <laughs> every single person in the country has to be alerted to it immediately. Yes, exactly that. Um, I don't uh, you wonder know. what you would do if that emergency alert come off. Like, where was it? Where is everyone running? I know exactly where I'm going to go because I was I was stood next to it when I did it. So um, up on the little uh, farm that I look after, there is a huge, great big grain silo, which is one of these ultra modern silos. So it's built like a it's built like a World War II bunker anyway. There's like one door going in the front where the tractors go in. And there's a little five point security door at the side, uh, and then it's got a thousand tons of grain and solar panels all across the roof, uh, and it's got a water ball hole next door. So quite frankly, I am going to be holed up in there like some kind of hideous hermit in the middle of, middle of a field somewhere i know exactly what i'm doing i've got it planned out yeah yeah i'm um <laughs> yeah, <I'm... laughs> all right fair enough oh, no, yeah. walls are pretty thin anyhow so i'm done for <laughs> um, yeah so there was obviously a post on facebook from lawrence barnard about um cilantro you can now use it for mice for field mice mm created it was pretty well received i think for most yeah. people it, it was well received I, I i think the only um real stumbling block was it and, and we were we debated a little bit of this online was um how this is going to change how people do pest control um what's going to happen with that i mean and that is a really interesting question because theoretically it shouldn't change the way that people do things but it is I already see the little smile on your face there, which is saying, but it is though, isn't it? Um, so there we go. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all for us having as many tools available to us as possible. And I think this move is definitely has a load of benefits. But I think in the cold light of day, when I stand back and look at it, I actually feel like it's a step back for pest controllers. Okay, I explain that one, because this will be an interesting part of the the debate which is so before before we lost field mice um but we never lost months. field mice technically we never had field mice that was the confusion field mice were definitely on the labels weren't they when i first when i first started using poison i think it'll be about seven year ago i'm sure we had um both both varieties of mice on there I'm pretty certain that beforehand, it simply just said for the control of rats and mice um, being a fairly broad and wood mice, apodemus were never, never officially named on the label. It was simply just left um, blank in the same way that on insecticide labels, you have crawling insects and cockroaches, you know, with the assumption being that if it crawls, it's an insect than it is but i don't believe because certainly from so from my experience um doing the field testing and um behind the scenes when you were when we were doing uh, applications for rats and mice the proviso was that you had to show control against uh what we call norms and the the, the, the norm species were brown rats and house mice to have that claim and then it changed over the years to become more prescriptive to rats and house mice and then if you wanted rats you had to do brown rats and black rats and if you wanted um if you didn't have brown rats and black rats then you had to do you know each individual species so it became more and more um prescriptive and that's what we saw in the the labels but i don't think we ever officially had wood mice and field mice as named species on the label i was fairly positive that we had had the four um latin names mentioned on a label but i think what whatever it was the reality the reality of the situation was six seven year ago that the norm for us and probably for a lot of people was that you would put poison down his box in boxes and use it almost as a monitoring bait um and then things changed with crew crew came in yeah couldn't do that anymore um and i felt 
like looking back now, I fight, I feel like the pest control industry picked up the manual, got a hold of it quickly, easily, ran with it, didn't really struggle with it. Um, and from a personal point of view, I feel like it changed the way we looked on mice. Um, field mice, we had an understanding that things needed them to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually finding a bit of mouse activity in a bait box for us now isn't an issue. Like it just isn't an issue. Um, I know speaking of resale the night, and he, he certainly got a couple of sites where he feels like putting DTEX blocks in encourages them in and then they get into warehouses and stuff like that. We we don't do that, but I can certainly see that. But I feel like we I can't remember having a situation where I thought to myself, if only we could poison field mice, this would be a lot easier. I just can't remember it. And I, I can't remember seeing a post of someone writing on in a public forum in any sort of sphere like I'm struggling with house mice. Like now we don't have poison. It's an issue. Um, and I feel like we started to show our levels of professionalism. We started to show that we weren't relying upon poison, that we could do it, are capable of doing it. We are professionals, we are heading in that direction. And as much as I love the idea of having this tool in the toolbox, I can't help feeling that we're gonna go back to be it in boxes around buildings. Yeah, so I'll take that. And I'd, there's two things that I'd come back to with that. So number one, uh, I have been in uh, a couple of sites where the number of field mice in especially rural conditions have started to um, encroach on the same levels that you might expect a house mouse population in indoors to start to start. Thinking. And, and every time I've encountered those, actually, it's been as you say, we are fully capable of controlling them with traps. But I've always thought there is a cut up. There is a there is going to be a tipping point within this that if I was unable to control these exclusively with uh, trapping, you know, mechanical control methods, where where could I go from that? And there was no onward. Um, uh, there was no onward uh, escalation process when that was concerned, and so it was a bit of a um, bit of a worry that if it ever did get beyond that point, and I'm sure there there will be many pest controllers who have uh, encountered that situation where suddenly, especially in um, agricultural rural areas where the number of field mice clearly outweighs the number of uh, house mice in a lot of these situations, um, that 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 is an issue. Um, so that's number one. Number two is, again, in, in more uh, rural and semi-rural locations, the fear of having a house mouse on a site where you've got rats. And although they will uh, exist in the same area and rats will, to an extent, exclude other rodent species, it's not a total exclusion. And of course, then the fear is, is you're baiting for rats um, and then you catch mice in the, uh, like field mice in the, cro- uh, in the crossfire. Um, and what do you do? You know, theoretically, under your risk assessment, you should say, right, there is presence of small non-target animals. I need to change my strategy to make sure that these non-target animals don't get caught in the crossfire and then have a downward stream of, um, you know, toxicity to, to the rest of the populations. So what did you do then? You had to go all the way back to, to traps and to all intents and purposes, it would get to a point where that rat population would become so dire um, because you would trying your level best to have a minimal impact. So colecalciferol um, and allowing it for field mice takes pressures off both of those equations. It gives an avenue for escalation that we didn't have before in areas of pure field mouse activity. And then areas where there's minor field mouse activity alongside a larger rodent problem, um, we can now hand on heart say we have a tool to control that larger rodent population. And if you know, the worst happens and we have field mice encountering those boxes at the same time, we're not breaking the law anymore. It, as if you would be if you put um, any of the escars down um, and field mouse got into that. But didn't didn't we, don't we have this without the mice being on the label, without having field mice on the label? Because this is how colecalciferol was sold to us, that as part of your environmental risk assessment, you can use this and you can say that you've mitigated that risk that if a mouse was to pick this up, there would be no secondary poisoning. So if you had that site, 
then you could use this with more confidence that you are you are causing less harm to the environment. And I, I understand having it on there, but I just feel like we're gonna go back over. It's just gonna be lazy pest control again. There is certainly a risk that people will see this as um you, you know your fire and forget missile type thing. You 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 basically you put it down, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um and honestly, that shouldn't be the case. We should, despite the fact that we have this um, de restrictions the wrong word, this, this expansion on use um, pattern, we should still be looking at applying that same risk hierarchy. Just because yeah. it's field mice doesn't See, this mean is the thing, though. I, I understand the theory and I understand yeah, yeah. what we should and shouldn't be doing, but the practicalities of it are absolutely, totally 100% different. And the fact that they we, we've just lost Vicam. Mm -hmm. because the use of it was going to be so minimal that they couldn't recoup the money on it. There is a reason why they have put hundreds of thousands of pounds or whatever it cost into putting mice on the label here, because someone has sat down and done the figures and worked out that as a result of doing this, they're going to make a load of money. That means that more of it's being bought. That means more of it's being thrown around the countryside. It, it, it I, I, I think the question it. around putting apodemus on um, this label has been one that has been around for a very long time, for 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 as long as stewardship's been about, if not a little bit longer. Because it, it and there's studies done, and I think um, Paul Westgate did one a little while back, um, actually looking at the ratio uh, in many circumstances of apodemus versus mus uh, in a lot of situations uh, and that apodemus is in fact becoming as much of a pest in some situations as the house mouse mus is is becoming and so should it not be treated as one of the the other commensal rodents i mean more, more there's certainly more apodemus um issues and infestations in the uk than there are black rats and yet you know People will have uh, will look for specific products on on black rats, so it, it it's a logical progression in that sense. I take your point that there probably was a large commercial bias to it, and especially being the first ones through the gate means that they will have um, an edge compared to other coli products by far, um, and certainly a lot of the other escars it will uh, put serious pressures on because it. Um, outside baiting, outside buildings, suddenly it, it becomes the the logical sense when it comes to risk management and environmental risk management. Yeah, I just <clears throat> I think it's great to have it. And I would hate to be in that situation where I needed it and I didn't have it. Mm -hmm. um, but when I look at the, the bigger picture, I feel like we are... Everybody complains in the pest control industry about not being seen as professionals and undervaluing the work and et cetera, et cetera. And we were in a position where we were pushing forward and starting to do exactly that, you know, start to recover old skills of how to deal with these problems. And then all of a sudden in the, in the wave of a wand, the pest control industry is going to be answerable to, um, to chemical manufacturers. That's what's going to happen. There's no getting around it. And if they can, I th think in, in the next however many years, you know, we've we've had a release happen where it shows that crew has been an abject failure, right? And I, I don't use them words lightly. It's absolutely failed um, in its ability to um, stop escorts getting into birds of prey, etc. So once that's gone, you've got two manufacturers who hold that ability to produce that chemical. Um, if you lose escorts, that competition is gone and people are already complaining about paying 200. But I mean, that's that, that's the other sort of side to this, isn't it? Which is um, those who have the traditional methods, their outlay and their overheads are going to be a different, uh, it's going to be a different makeup, isn't it? Because the the skill is what you're charging for there and the um, actual tools are a series of traps which the cost of which they're reusable um, they have uh, lower impacts and so again you, they, they're they still competitive it depends on how you wish to to have a look at that and no no I mean like say, say you're a guy who, who you know vast majority of companies across the country are going to start poisoning the reality of this is that if you lose the escorts and now you've got this viable alternative with 
mice on that farmers can use, you know, capably. They do a half a day course because nothing's going to change with that. They do it. They can buy. They can. They can buy a whole bucket full of it. They can lash it down where they want. The 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 authorities on it are so wide. From you know, we've got borabate on calciferol, not on this one, but we have got it. We've got um covered and protected. We've now got field mice, house mice, rats, etc. It's so open that it's that it's going to happen, and they're going to buy an absolute ton of it. Once you lose escars, it's not rocket science, you know, that once they've got control of that market, these two firms aren't going to give that up. They're not going to spend this money on this product to give it up. So everyone else who produces an anticoagulant, if that goes, you've got two people who are saying, well, we don't have a monopoly on it. We've got 50% of the market each. And, you know, the price all of a sudden jumps up to 350, 400 quid a bag. Like, and I'm just looking in the future, thinking, is this the right thing for us so, at this moment in time? Like, why? Yeah, there are you, ways around you know, that. Steering away from chemicals. So theoretically, under and I'm not sure how HSE is going to look at this, but under EU law previously, you could make a reasonable request for data. Uh, and you could say, right, I wish to buy into your package if there was no other option and I want to pay this much. And it went through a big tribunal, but it means that actually people can buy into their own Coley products if they so wish. It's just at the moment, a lot of the other manufacturers have put their eggs in the Escar basket to lasting another five, six, seven, ten years, another re-registration process. But you've got to bear in mind, a lot of other these manufacturers as well are going to be looking for alternatives to alternatives. Coley calciferol is a great molecule, but it is not uh, the be all and end all. It, we had it before, we lost it, it came back again for resistance management reasons. Uh, it does have, and, and, and as much, I, I'm a big advocate of coli when it's used in the right way but it does have its deficits that there, there are things that are uh that it doesn't do well at uh, you know primary poisoning being being one of those things um and so you find that a lot of the manufacturers are working on their own things aces up their sleeves whatever they may be so and i think i was, I was only having this conversation the other day that we think because we are right in the industry that every time something like this changes it's a big thing that the industry is going to change um forever but actually if you look back on it we have a big big shift in how the industry works every five to seven years and if you look back on it five to seven years ago stewardship changed the way we used escars changed the way we uh, approach yeah. situations um yeah, yeah. It, oh, sorry it changed the way we use escars but you have to remember that we are a very we are the smallest section of escar users that are actually in this country uh, but but we we can't talk for everyone else i mean that's that's the problem if, if if we could wave a magic wand we would make sure that um those who use them irresponsibly never use them again but unfortunately that's that falls well out of the capacity for um us in our industry to police other um other larger parts of the escar using community other industries um you know the general public the gamekeepers and the um, farming communities they will have their own um things going on but i mean you, you go back five and ten years before that uh we had a whole load of other products you you know we had things like um strychnine we had um red squill we had uh hydrogen cyanide zinc phosphide uh we had a whole load of other bits and bobs you go back further than that we had a whole load of different products we you know you go back to the um early 90s and we didn't have a lot of the escars that we have today you go back to the um 80s and or the 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 you know mid 80s uh and we're only starting to really start to use the escars it was all fcars before that so actually every 10 years let's say let's take it in decade leaps we do have a monumental change in how our industry works it's this just is, the fact that this, this is the issue that i have would do and i felt like would 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 pick that up and run with it and boss it mm. like as an industry I really genuinely feel like we boss this, you're not allowed to kill mice thing. And then all of a sudden it's back on it and you think, we're just whipping boys for the chemical manufacturers. Like we were doing well. The most, you know, the, the, there's no way in the world that they didn't feel some sort of financial hit through people starting to put traps and boxes and monitoring things rather than putting poison in it. So they, they must it, the must of, and then all of a sudden it's like, Flick of a pen, we're back there, we're back to that. You know, and uh, Lawrence has promised, promised, he's given his word 
and I'll hold him to this because he is a, he's now a spokesman for the manufacturer that under no uncertain terms is this going to become a amateur use product. Um, I've got to be totally honest with you. I genuinely don't see a problem with it being an amateur use product. I don't worry about amateur use products. Um, but I, 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 I worry because I'm a lot not. of people do. I say I I worry about it becoming uh, amateur. So I I worry about it falling out of the realms of professional or competent users, only because of the significant primary toxicity um, risks uh, associated with it. Um, if they could if they could put one sachet of calciferol in a sealed um, mouse box, like a mm -hmm. fully sealed unit, and sell five. Five mouse boxes in a pack to the homeowner. I've got no issues with that. Uh, yeah, if, if if you can police it the right way, and if you can make sure people don't kick those boxes open, and uh, that and, and that has been discussed, and, and in fact, I think a lot of the um, ready to use stations are sold without keys, so they cannot be tampered with and and opened, uh, and a lot of them are heat sealed. Uh, but that comes with its other um, deficits, which is it's increasing one use plastic waste because what happens to those boxes after they're used they're thrown away they're not recycled uh they're not reused and so you're contributing to an environmental um environmentally damaging aspect of our industry which is waste um just in a different way in, in plastics as opposed to um small amounts of poison um which is worse uh depends on what environment you're looking at at the end of the day um, but it, they, they it all comes with their issues. But I don't disagree. And I, I've said it before that I think a lot of the uh, amateur use products, which um, you are assuming that that person is going to read the label and you can't promise that they will, need to be presented in such a way that they are uh, infallible in, in their um, application. There, there, there's no way you can um, circumvent it and cause an issue with it. And as you say, single use stations is, is probably the easiest way to achieve that. Mm. So you're saying that it will or it won't make a difference to what we do and how we do it on a day-to-day -day basis? If it becomes an amateur use? No, no, I mean, like, just as it stands now, we've got it on there. Fresh news product, it is what it is. Um, Tomorrow, the day after, the next, the, the short, the immediate future, the next three months, six months, whatever it is, will or won't make a difference to the way that we complete our work. Right. Honestly? I would hope, best case scenario, but well, not even best case scenario, <laughs> I would hope that the norm is that we take all of that information that we have assimilated over the last, you know, five, seven years of, of stewardship, um, applying this escalation approach, applying this, um, the maximum impact for the minimum cost approach, uh, going in there. And if it can be solved with environmental proofing, trapping, chemical moving up through those um, degrees of escalation we still apply that just because it has something new put on the label doesn't mean that we jump straight to oh, that no, but you're missing the question yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Un I understand all that the question uh, the question is do you think that's going to happen or do you think that uh, well yeah and, and, and my answer is is i hope that's what's going to happen but uh, on, honestly um i yes i i see that as, i'm going to put i'm going to all of you guys <laughs> pointing at you all um this is what you've learned. This is what we've trained to do. This is what we understand. This is what you need to continue to do. And if you just flip, if you just roll straight back over to that, um, you know, just using chemicals because it has it on the label, then you've learned nothing and you've achieved nothing. And all of that skill, all of that hard work, um, you are willingly just throwing away. And that would be a real shame considering that we have worked so hard to show our diligence and professionalism and that we don't need, you know, it's a tool, it's a chemical, it's a tool. It is not our industry. We're pest managers and pest control is a small part of that. Don't forget all the shit that you've learned. And if you say, do you see it making a change? Yes, it will obviously make a change. There will be those people who will simply just revert back to using chemicals because it's an easy uh, approach. But I'd hope the majority of us will say, fuck it, we, we've learned all of this. It, you know, this makes our lives easier in some respects, but it shouldn't be a um, a slot in and a replacement for good practice and all of that knowledge that we have um, strove so hard to achieve. And, you know, all this conversation, all of this communication with the wider community, with our clients, with, you know, um, big companies where we said, look, 
we can we can do this any situation does we've got the knowledge and we've got the skills to find a way to just turn around and say yeah it's just as easy as throwing a sachet down no it's not and we know it's not so why why i'm not you off the hook though the question is fuck <laughs> and I, I understand everything you said <laughs> do you think that the pest control industry is going to do the right thing as you've just explained be the professionals, or do you think, as a general rule, they'll go back to a reliance upon Putin? And I'm, 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 we're, we're going to do the right thing. We are going to do the right thing, uh, and that uh, I, I don't want to be shown, but we're going to do the right thing. We are. We're absolutely going to do the right thing. And if we do the yeah, wrong thing, guys, um, I know where each and every one of you lives, and I will be right. <laughs> I, I the other thing as well, of course, is um. Cost was brought up. Norman Smith put a comment on about saying there won't be amateur because they won't pay two hundred quid. Mm -hmm. But actually, if I got amateur use on it, um, where we we are effectively paying amateur prices for this product in terms of um, if you take eight kilos at two hundred quid and you divide it down and you sell it in one hundred and fifty gram, two hundred gram sachets, which is what they do. It's a few. It's probably equivalent to what they are paying for an amateur use product at this moment in time. You know, would it go up a little bit? Of course it would. But then can can the big boys use this to squeeze the likes of me and the likes of other people that um, all of a sudden, you know, if you're a, I don't say a poor pest controller because that's wrong, but if you're a guy who's going to rely on chemicals in boxes because it's easier and you go once a month and you fill it up and what have you and you, you're there or thereabouts, all of a sudden... And I, I've heard the the cost deficit with regards to it costs a lot more to buy the calciferol, but it takes a lot less to kill the rats. So they work out around about the same. Well, that's great until every month it's getting destroyed in a box through weather and slugs and all this. And your your cost of your treatment is going up. Can the big boys use this to squeeze the smaller boys out that they can they can keep putting this down? Um they can they can jump to that and sort of force people's hands into having to put it down that people aren't going to be happy without poison and boxes because I still get it. I still I get I went to a massive site the other day, a really forward thinking company, like probably one of the most forward thinking companies in the world. Um, to have a look at one of their sites and I was talking to the bloke and I said, we can't just put poison in boxes anymore. Um, we can't even call it permanent baiting. It has to be long-term baiting. And he looked at us and he went, okay, we'll have a two-year long-term baiting plan. Okay. You know, that was that was their response. Like, we want poison in boxes. That's what we want. And you think if they can push that button and the big boys jump and they start doing this, like where... Is it going to squeeze the little guys? Sadly, yes, because it all comes down to economies of scale. Uh, and that's what you're looking at when you're looking at a company that has a turnover of, you know, a, a, a millions of, you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds a year compared to uh, a smaller one man or two man band. Um, there, there will sadly be a break point in economies of scale. But then again, the smaller one or two man bands has other values that they can apply to these contracts um yeah. which larger more inflexible companies cannot and so at that point you have to you have to build your strategy both you, you know your, your client strategy, not just your pest management strategy but your client approach strategy around what it is that you can offer okay i i can't offer you know um the price breaks on on this and if it does it's going to come with its own costs but then you sell yourself on those other aspects that you can um you can, you know, uh, a more rapid response, a more flexible uh, approach. Um, I can do trapping more often because I am able to come back uh, at more regular intervals. The other thing that we need to consider as well, the, ne the, the other revolution that's going on at the moment, and the revolution I thought was going to be the next thing as opposed to cilantro, is the shift to digital technology, which actually allows for smaller people to not just be more reactive, but a lot more uh, involved with their pest management contracts. Um, okay, there's an outlay there, and there is a cost implication with that. But, but with the, the truth is, Alex, that we're not we can't compete with the big boys. Man, was talking to a lad the other day, um, one of the nationals, they're selling a digital system 
into a place at £35 per box. Right? Eh? I can't buy a trap at that. I can't even come close to buying a trap at that. Doesn't even, it, it like, because of that economy of scale and their ability to sign them up, like, they, they are bossing the digital world. The smaller guys are, we, we you know, 10, 10 traps for them, 350 quid, 10 traps for me, like, don't know what that would be with them. I mean, probably, I'd probably be looking at charging about two and a half grand. It goes through the roof, doesn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, that's something I just, I don't have an answer for. It 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 is always been one of those things. It's that's that, and it's not a new phenomenon. It is that uh, economy of scale and that, and yet we still all do compete with um, those uh, larger organisations because there are things that we can offer. You know, we we being um, the the collective community that can offer that they cannot, and we just have to be more cognizant of where those differences lie and it, it it sadly is as you say it, it's not going to necessarily be on a, a price break because we simply just don't have um the breadth of that buying power um in order to achieve that same level of um you know economy of scale or scale of economy yeah I th yeah here's my good feeling i think what's going to happen is we will absolutely go back to being a, a, a poison slave across the board um i think the agricultural sector will absolutely continue to do what they do they will just swap an escar for a calcium for all product um and i think it'll probably at some point in the next however many years get turned into an amateur use product um i i, I just genuine i can't see how i can't see how they can't you know if i was I'm no, no business mentor by any stretch of imagination. But if I was in charge of one of those two companies producing calciferol, when you look at the the revenue that you could generate, you know, dead in 24 hours, write that on the packet. You know, like, I, I just, and I, I don't have a problem with it. I really don't. Um, I mean, uh... There's a flip side of looking at this, and we, we've had this conversation before. I mean, we had a similar conversation when it talked when we talked about um, you know losing FICAM. Um, the the very much your reply to that was adapt or die, uh, yeah. and, and let's be fair. And, and with this coming back on again, uh, it's the same it's the same problem but in reverse. Um, if you think about it, now the other way of having a look at this. Sorry, is just to take... jump in. That's exactly what I was saying, though. Yeah, and this is what this is what's. This is what's sticking in my throat. When we lost escorts for um, field mice, adapt or die. Mm -hmm. The industry absolutely overnight adapted, changed the way we thought, changed the way we played. Everything was good. We, and I feel like we took a step forward. Given us this, I've just got this horrible feeling that we're going to jump back to what we are doing before, just with a different product in a box. So we need to then think about how we can take this forwards in a positive way. We fold mm -hmm. it into our strategies uh, and you, you we make that as part of that forward momentum that we have achieved over the last so many years and keep rolling forwards only with the fact that now we have something extra we need and, and i fully appreciate what you're saying that there will be a level of regression to that um but if you think about it those who take all of that skill that we've generated before in that adaptive process and then add this on as well then we've gone, you know, not just one step forward to one step back, we've gone two steps forwards. And so you'd hope, therefore, that those who have taken two steps forwards are further ahead of the game than those who have gone one step forward and one step back because mm -hmm. they've got that additional level of uh, competence and knowledge to augment this programme we have. You don't have to choose one or the other. You don't have to be, I'm going to go this way, I'm going to go this way. No, choose some kind of synergy between the two of them make it work for both and understand that you know take all of that knowledge and those tools and those risk factors um and make them work for you we understand them better now so you can make a more informed decision i can mm -hmm. run I, I would love it if they made I, I don't know if this is possible i might be totally and utterly barking up the wrong tree i would love it if they said you can use this on field mice but only in line with um, an environmental risk assessment. 
You will still have to do an environmental risk assessment, no, no doubt. I mean, like, turn it into the label so it then becomes law. Like, this is, it's not just, it's not just this is what you should or shouldn't be doing, but when they changed it to label as law is, for this to be used, there must be an environmental risk assessment completed. I um, believe that in a very roundabout way, that is on the label because it says all of these products they must be used in accordance to the crew codes of best practice and the crew codes of best practice do state their need for an environmental risk assessment prior to um, this and it was stated that um curly calciferol would be included under the stewardship program so curly calciferol the, the stewardship program is not just escars it's escars and the coleys so there is that um element rolled into both of them and because stewardship is very focused on eras then yes even if you are just using coley um you should still be doing an environmental risk assessment because the same way that if you're just using traps in your you, you decide to use traps you should still be doing an environmental risk assessment um because what you're saying is i've done environmental risk assessment and you know this is the level of pest pressure this is the level of environmental risk and therefore i'm going to choose the most appropriate product and it may be escars it may be alpha it might be coley it may very well then be traps or environmental manipulation but you should still be doing an era um even if you are doing just an exclusive trapping program. Yeah, the reality of it is, though, and this is where you and I kind of diverge, isn't it? You're like, we should be doing this, and I hope everyone's doing this. And I'm like, they're not. <laughs> they're not. I can't trust them to do that. That's why I know, or that's why I feel like I know, that I'm, that what's going to happen is they're going to fall straight back into the into the problem of being a, a, a poison slave, where it's like, fill it up. Listen, you don't have time for that muck at. Put four sachets in that box. You've got ten set. You've got ten routines to do today. You know, get round them. Like sack your digital trap and off. Open the box. Take the dirty ones out. Put new ones in. Shut the box. Move on. Open the box. And I, I just feel like in giving us the ability to deal with field mice for this, that's exactly where we've walked back into. We've walked and we've walked into it like go like ah, yes, please, yes, please. As an industry, and I think I, I I don't know if it's good or bad. Time will tell, I guess. It, it will. I mean, the proof of the pudding will very much be in the next couple of months of eating, won't it? To see how people's um, attitudes towards these change. Uh, and unfortunately, there there have already been instances in Northern Ireland of um, issues with primary non-target poisoning, which have led to a review in Northern Ireland of the Coleys, um, which is probably. Is it? Sorry, I, I believe you... I believe so. I don't believe that's me talking out of my hoop um i was talking to someone in northern ireland who said that it it'd been a bit of a media uh sensation for them just before christmas um so I, and again i mean th this again this this is part of your environmental risk it has risks the risks are just simply a different series of risks so you still need to do that system uh, going back to environmental risk assessments just full stop I, I think one of the biggest problems people have with them is and forgive me if i'm wrong but people fail to see the value in doing an environmental risk assessment. A lot of the times um, it's taking up time on sites that you should be doing something else. It's taking up time where you could just get in, get in, get out, job done, onto the next one. What is the, you know, what is the net gain of a, 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 an ERA, despite the fact that it is, um, you know, like any of the other risk assessments you do, it's a uh, box ticking, ask covering exercise. And, Sadly, I mean, that's not how I view them personally, but I think sadly that's how a lot of other people see them as a a nuisance uh, uh, with, with no value to them. And am I right in saying that? Uh, or would you say that's, you know, that... Well, that's... I think, truthfully, I think the vast majority of people don't do them because they don't know how to do them. They don't know okay. where the template is. They don't know how, what boxes to fill in. I think there's absolutely an amount of, because we don't know how to do them and we don't know what to do with them, um, yeah, you you can ring up any of the manufacturers and say, have you got a treatment report pad in duplicate or triplicate? We'll probably supply you one. They won't have one for an ERA. Um, I've never seen one. I've never heard anybody talking about them. It's almost I feel like ERAs. It's almost an out of out of sight, out of mind. Um, I can't remember ever one of our audits ever picking up on an ERA. I say a couple of my red tractor ones have started to pick up them a bit bit more often these days but it, it's only been in the last 
year or so um, that they've started to be challenged a little bit more. And certainly I know when I do my audits, I will always challenge for an ERA uh, to see if they have been done. And a lot of times they haven't. Uh, for those wondering who want to know, it's thinkwildlife.org. There is a uh, ERA template on there. You just have to scroll through and scroll through and scroll through. Unfortunately, it's, it, it's, it's set out in a little bit of a awkward. Yeah, all of their downloadable documents are on one page. So you have to just keep scrolling through till you find it. But it is a PDF on online. It's a two page one, but it, it doesn't tell you. You just simply fill it out um, and it doesn't say, right, you've completed your ERA. This is the safe brackets of what you've got to use. It, it's a completely subjective response after that point. Now, I am working on a product uh, product project product at the moment, which will turn or help to turn an ERA into a sub, uh, an objective platform as opposed to a subjective platform. Um, but you might just have to wait to see that because it's um, we're working on that. We, with... we have them on our system, and I can get the lads to do them in about three minutes. Like they're, they're not a they're not a long document if you know what you're doing. And I I believe. No, in fact, I'm going to say it's not even believe. I, I pretty much know that the difference is when you start writing stuff down. Um, it does change the way you think about your doing yeah. things because all of a sudden you go. I'm not sure if that's right anymore. Like we could tighten that up. We could do this, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you know that someone's going to pick up that document and read your document and they're going to. Um, it, it, it puts a measure of accountability onto you at yeah, that point. Yeah, on that usage, doesn't it? Yeah. So I, I think that could, could be a good thing going forward. But I would guess that what that would do is it would slow down the sales of um, calciferol. So I'm guessing that there probably won't be a push to do that. And it would make life more difficult for the pest controller. So they're not going to want to do that. And this is this whole thing, isn't it? Like nobody sees us as professional. No one sees us as professional. Well, you could do ERAs and you could do this and you could do Well, I haven't got time for that. Uh, um, I, yeah. yeah. I, I believe as part of our professional uh, competent status, everyone should be doing uh, an ERA. It's just, a, it, it's, it's a double-sided bit of A4. And as soon as you get the hang of it, they are, um as quick to do you know you do them as you do your initial site survey as you're wandering around looking for um all of your fuzzy little buggers on site you simply just do it uh in tandem with that but the joy of the era as you say there and you've kind of hit your nail on the head and i believe that the, the uh, manufacturers of coley will push for more eras to be done because it makes you sit there and think, as you say before right i've found pheasants i found small birds i found small ground nesting mammals uh birds of prey um and already by doing that era you're starting to exclude those bioaccumulative persistent and toxic chemicals from the top of the list and you'll move down towards the alphas and the the, the coles as being uh still um persistent with the environment and, and toxic but they're not bioaccumulative by any measure at that point uh and so you, you're reducing those risks and it would make them the more a uh, viable option in in a lot of these uh instances not every one of them there's, there's still going to be plenty of sites where scars are the the preferred candidates because they require you know in a lot of circumstances they require less material to be eaten it's a more rapid engagement for uh a more cost effective um base horses for courses at the end of the day um and again i'd hope that by applying that same level of logic there's still going to be sites especially for field mice where trapping is going to be the cheapest easiest and most um cost and time effective uh, method to control mice you wouldn't want to put down four kilos of um coli calciferol around a site to control a minor infestation of house mi uh, field mice sorry um when you can have that same impact by just simply using a series of well-placed um, snap traps. Yeah, just, I think I know what will happen here. It will be a case of, you know, if you look at calciferol in relation to a DTEX block, like you tip up and that's, what, that's the way it's going to be looked at. It'll be like, oh, yeah, they've eaten half of that one. Whip it out and replace it. You know, uh, yeah, 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 mouse damage, but don't worry, it's fine. They're allowed on the label and I can just see it happening across... And not just the little man, the little man, the big man, the massive organisations, the agricultural firms. The, it, I, I can just see this being an absolute step back for us in terms of being seen as professionals. You know, um, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I, I can only just 
disagree I, out of nothing but hope <laughs> is, is where I'm getting with that. <laughs> um, That's a dangerous thing relying on hope, isn't it? It, it is. Um, but at the same time, I believe that we've, as you say, we've progressed so far as an industry and I would be, I'd be disappointed if we regressed so easily. Um, we will. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking, I, I am on principle. I am taking the counter to, to that. Yeah. I believe that some will, the majority of us will hold true and no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, well, we're going to see, aren't we? And, do you know, I, I honestly, hand on my heart, I pray to God I'm wrong because I would love for us to move forward as an industry, being professional, not relying upon it, um, having that tool in our armory that when that really bad job comes up that you're speaking about, that it's there, that you can boss it, you can really start to get all your eggs together and, you know, start to formulate a plan. I, I'm just not hopeful that that's going to be the the outcome of getting field mice on this you know um but we'll see yeah well bear in mind as well it's just field mice um we're not talking about and they've specifically named you know uh the field mouse as opposed to the wood mouse um so you're still gonna have to do an image we haven't mentioned bank voles or field voles which also share territories with field mice yeah, but so this is be... the weird thing isn't it no one yeah. cares about that this is the weird, weird thing, isn't it? That when you go to an agricultural site, you go to a rural site, you go to a urban, urban fringe site, whatever it is you're going to, if you've got field mice on that label, they're like, it's fine. It's fine. So you can do it. Come on. Like, we can do it. And I guess it's because that the the evidence that the others leave is so similar that you that they just jump them into the same melting pot of um but I bet arguably then, so what's what's changed? Because beforehand, if people were so willing to misidentify field mice for house mice, as we all know that a lot of people would do, um, you'd, you'd, you'd see sort of like, oh, the problem with field mice has disappeared. Now I miraculously have a problem with house mice, so I'm going to be doing something else. Um, so what's changed? Nothing's changed. Other than the fact that we have a legitimate uh, avenue now. Yeah, I think, I think what did change was... Um when you when we lost that authority on the label people started putting traps down started putting rat traps down started using lures and traps and they stopped and all of a sudden finding that evidence in your box which so, would have stressed you out before no longer stressed you out because you saw that you weren't getting the problems that you thought you would have got and people moved away from just leave it or yeah I know lots of people who have genuinely moved away from just putting poison in boxes 24 so A lot of those people as well. So again, if you think about it like that, we've got field mice on there for specific field mice problems. But in those boxes, those boxes around the outside of the site, it was never just field mice that were the concern. It was field mice. It was voles. It was um, all of the other things as well. So with that, do you think that people will, because they've just got field mice, you know, one extra animal against a whole host of the other non-targets will say, all right, I'll just use coli now. Or they'll sit there and think, actually, no, I will continue to use snap traps because yeah, because what they'll think is they'll go, do you know what it is? My conscience is clear because I know that whether it's a field mouse, a vole, a wood mouse, whatever it is that eats this, if that barn owl up there eats it, there's no secondary poison and the barn owl is going to be fine. We're cooking on gas, everything's great. Um, I can I can justify it on paper and I can justify it morally to myself that even if things that aren't quite on the label and I can say, well, it's just mice, it's just mouse activity in the box because, you know, no, I don't know the difference between the droppings of a field mouse and a, and a vole, you know, I just don't. Um, but I do wonder, I do, I do wonder if the increase in biodiversity that we, and I'm not willing to try this on the farm. We have a farm, I know you do as well, that we've, tried incredibly hard on and mm -hmm. we've now we now see a lot of barn owls on it mm -hmm. i do wonder if i went back to boxes and poison whether those barn owl numbers would drop simply through um not through poisoning but through a lack of available food source for them because we probably were wiping out hundreds and hundreds of um of their natural food so like 
Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. It does make sense. I, I think, yeah, I think you see more barn owls closer to the buildings because the number of uh, the number of small ground uh, mammals increased close to the buildings. Uh, if you kill a lot of so again, uh, one of the things that instigated a lot of the uh, stewardship was a huge decline in barn owl numbers around 2013, 2014, I think it was, or 12, 13. It was it was early 2010s, around that time, um, and there was a massive dip in the number of barn owl chicks fledging that year. And of course, the, the blame got solidly placed on, on poisons. Um, actually, when you have a look back over the data, there is a very clear correlation between um, a period of very heavy rain, I think it was, and a lot of those um, meadows getting flooded and all of the voles and all of the um, bank voles and uh, field voles simply just got washed out to sea, you know, either drowned or or. or didn't weren't as prolific that year and because they weren't as prolific the numbers of bound isles did did, did drop um but again we're talking about affecting an island ecosystem in a much greater ocean of of life and so yes the effects that you have will have a localized impact but so long as that impact isn't uh by cumulative across a larger proportion mm -hmm. it'll be it'll be lower it'll still have an impact i mean if you if you kill every um, small ground mammal uh, in a hundred meters around a building, then yes, you will probably find there are fewer barn owls around your buildings. But if you kill them all with a bicumulative uh, chemical, you'll find that the numbers of barn owls around your building will drop, and the numbers of barn owls that would have been coincidentally coming, you know, on the edges of their territories to your buildings, um, mm. would have dropped as well. So, so it will have an effect, but it won't have a much larger effect, and that's no bad thing. But I see what you mean that it, it it will have an effect, but the effects will not be quite so pronounced as when they are or when they were by cumulative, persistent, and toxic. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Yeah, and the other thing as well, of course, is as long as it's not biocumulative, you can pretty much change the course of it overnight, can't you? By changing your actions because it isn't accumulated, it, it's like that them numbers will will spring back. Um, but yeah, the only other thing I wanted to ask you about was there was a um. A press release in relation to crew the other day um about brodificum's um appearance in barn owls thoughts um refresh my mind as to what as in the the, the amount of brodificum found within barn owls had increased was this yeah, something like i don't want to quote definite figures i can't remember them off the top of my head but i think it was like 70 and 75 and 82 percent or something out of barn owls that were tested um were found to have raw difficum in them. Okay. Um, and what, not unsurprising, what, what, mostly because over the last, you know, yeah, since... Did you say the reason why they give for why it was turning up in them? Uh, I'll, I'll have two guesses. Number one is the restrictions on use for open area, uh, sorry, from indoors only to, to outdoors. And number two would be the increased use of bradyficum in terms of resistance management. Um, that would be the two answers I give. Alternatively, it's sense. because it of sense. misuse and abuse uh, from other communities. That's exactly what they blamed it on. They said that they thought that, bro, that the reason why it was turned up in barn owls was because it shouldn't be used in open areas and they yep. can only put it down to illegal use in open areas i was thinking is this is this a there, there, there is a large there, there, there was a couple of court or one big court case a little while back with um an individual court uh lacing chicks with bradyficum much in the same way that chicks used to be laced with bendiacarb to kill um raptors uh and that's he was one, that's one idiot it's not it's that's not it's one possible. idiot who was caught um i'm sure that there are others but of course and, and again but it should not be used as an open area and so it should again we should be back to our our island theory so if you're finding it moving much further out into the environment it's because it's being used in a way that it is um but, it, but this is the issue and this is the problem i had with it that that isn't that would appear to be a, an absolute propaganda spin on the evidence that was presented because the vast majority of barn owls as you said mm. are knocking around buildings on farms mm. picking up mice that have eaten prodiphacum um and that would appear to be the clear vector into them to try and distance us from that and say oh no no it's not us we're doing a great around the buildings it's certainly it's not getting into barn owls through us yeah because yeah. i can remember when 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 crew first kicked off, 
for Daifukun wasn't being found in them. Because it was indoors use only. It, it, it was being found in small volumes. I mean, they found um, they found Bradifkum in some peregrine falcons, which was really alarming because... Yeah, that is alarming. Yeah, because because that, yeah. should, that shouldn't happen at all. Um, so very quickly, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, do you know the difference between a saturation baiting uh, and a pulse baiting uh, strategy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so... Uh, and again, I, I think a lot of people kind of use the two terms almost interchangeably. Pulse baiting, but I've been pulse baiting, you should be using a very small amount and you should be letting it to run to zero before you top up to run to zero to top up. I think one of the problems is, is in the pest management community, we are taught saturation baiting, which is your multi feeds, pulse baiting, which is your single feeds. And we do stick to that roughly. We let our single feeds run to zero before we top up to run to zero to top up and so that unfortunately other communities as well may not be quite so well versed in the distinction between pulse and saturation baiting and so if you use a pulse bait flacumafen uh as a saturation bait then you are going to ramp up those numbers so there is an element of education and communication that needs to go out with that but the big problem is and this is not me making excuses for the industry by any way shape or form um one of the big problems we've always had for a very long time is Bradifukum, when it gets into that bar now, you have no idea where it came from. There's no radio marker to it. There's no change in that chemistry. There's no identifiable, traceable pattern that as soon as it's left that formulation, as soon as it's been ingested by an animal, it is simply just a chemical inside that animal. As a product, you can say, right, that's a block, that's a grain, that's a sachet. I can trace that back. That's been bought by so-and-so. That comes from a, you know, it's likely that that came from X, Y, and Z. As soon as it gets into that food chain, that's it. We've lost all traceability on that. Um, and so it, it's it's supposition, not necessarily wrong, but it is supposition to say these are the people at fault because... Well, I, yeah, I think I think that's all that happened. They jumped on that one wally down in... It's like down south on it, right on the south coast. It's a and, um, so like I can't remember what he'd done, but he, he was doing something, and yeah, and it's like, oh yeah, no, that that's what we're going to say. It's not a total failure of this scheme. It's not us. It's it's a handful of of um, bad eggs who are spoiling this. But it it is it is for me the way that we are using it. It just shows that there was a there was a shift, probably about six years ago, wasn't there, from using. Um, Diphenacum bromodialon to Bradifacum. Um and when we shifted the it's clear that the amount that's being found in them is 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 jumping up. So we are responsible. There's no getting around it. Here's going to be a little bit of statistics for you then, um, because It'll be professional pest controllers who, as you say, will be more willing to lean into using uh colicalciferol in a more permanent perimeter style it will not be those other communities where the fingers are being pointed it won't be them it's too expensive for them it will be a self-exclusionary measure you won't find people uh trebucheting cilantro or harmonex or calisocalciferol uh into a field it's too expensive to simply broadcast bait in the same way that you would do um the grains which is what we fear may be happening so in that sense next year we'll have a look at those numbers because if those numbers reduce dramatically the amount of bad i've found oh then it was us wasn't it because it was what we were doing uh, and we've changed what we're doing and the numbers have changed if however those numbers remain high then guess what it wasn't us all along i don't i don't know i think it, the, the issue is isn't it that like we aren't taking into account that probably the number one and everyone's like this, like, oh, it's a, it's a no blame pot, it's a no blame this, it's a no blame that. It's quite clear where the blame lies. It's agricultural sector, isn't it? Like, I'm not, I've been around enough of them now to know exactly why it's happening. And the, the burying the head in the sand and not wanting to up the, upset them and say, you're not using this properly. Um, I, I believe my good feeling is that if we, if the agricultural sector picks up colicalciferol, there will be a huge drop in the amount of Bradyphacum and other escorts found in birds of prey. Um, if they don't, and of course you do have that factor of price, isn't there? Like how is it policed and who's going to police them? 
or Red Tract are going to say, well, you shouldn't be using this. We, we expect you to use Coley or, or what. I think that will be the determining factor on whether we find it or not, how, how the agricultural sector is dealt with. Again, I mean, but to to to, to look at this is, uh, you know, to take a, a positive out of a loss here, we've got two options with that, haven't you? They embrace this new yeah. practice. They run forwards with it. The level of Bradyphacum, the level of eschars in the environment drops. Happy days. We get to preserve the use of eschars because the pressure which has been put yeah. on them at the moment is reduced. They get an abeyance. We get to use them. Our toolkit remains. Flip side of that. They don't embrace it. It all goes absolutely, you know, peaked on. Um, and suddenly they they don't want to embrace um, Coley because it's too expensive. And so there is a greater market for professionals um, to to join, jump into them because yeah. so they either do it right. They either jump on the bandwagon uh, and they do it and we get to have a full toolkit. They don't do it. It, it breaks the uh, there's the last straw that breaks the camel's back and we end up picking up their um their pieces. You know what it is? I never thought of that. That could be it may be a massive, massive bonus for us if the agricultural sector do get this and adopt it and red tractor and whoever it is jumps on it. Because you're absolutely right. If we are staring down the barrel of a gun with escorts, and if this increased authorization allows them to put it down and for them to be safe and without being rude, the, the poison their own dog, you know, the, the, they've done that. I don't know which farmer hasn't poisoned his own dog at some point. They've all done it. I don't think it's too much of a concern for a lot of them, is it? Like from, from the lads I've spoken to, they don't like doing it, but it's like, oh no, it's happened, you know, but that's their lookout, isn't it? If you're putting poison down on your farm, that is your lookout. And if that level does drop and all of a sudden, instead of us staring down the barrel of a gun, they go, well, actually, you can keep escorts. Yep. You can keep them. Like, I don't think there's anybody out there would argue that that isn't an absolutely phenomenal place to end up. Yeah, because it, it, it means that we have a range of tools at our disposal that allow us to, you know, because we're not just doing, we're not just dealing with the agricultural markets, are we? We're, we're dealing with, you know, everything from inner city all the way out to outer Hebrides. Uh, right. And so we need to have a range of tools that can slot into any situation, be those, you know, mechanical all the way up to, you know, thermonuclear in some instances. But yeah, if we can step back from that precipice by hook or by crook, then that is no bad thing. That that is a brilliant thing, yeah. I would love to see um I'd love to see some another active on the greed and act another active on the market. You know, I just pray to God. Just out of interest, how long will it take before if everyone stopped putting down escorts today? Today it got banned and everyone jumped on the calciferol. How long would would you expect or how long would the manufacturers expect it to be before we saw a drop? Because it is bioaccumulative, like yeah. in the birds and in the in the environment. So the half life of a lot of these chemicals. So half life is the amount of time. So the biological half life, sorry, is the amount of time it takes for let's say ten units to degrade to five units yeah. within a body. And so the biological half life of things like warfarin um, is about twenty eight days, which is why they use it medically because it has a relatively quick clearance time. Things like uh, diphenacum and bromodilone, I'm led to believe. Again, it depends on the animal as well. Some animals have a much more rapid excretion time. Some have a lot lower. But again, on average, we are looking at about three to six months um, with things like the single feeds. Um, sometimes it can be a year, if not more, but it's always being eliminated from those bodies. So to say a year, a year is just the amount of time it takes to get rid of half of it. Um, so give it 18 months and we should be down to, you know, a third. Um, so we would be looking at for some of the more um, potent escars, potentially um, a year, if not more, to start to see a significant reduction in in samples. And how but, often do the crews do the sampling? Uh, so I'm led to believe the PBMS report they take a hundred birds a year and send them off for pathology um, a year. So it's a hundred birds, and that's over the course of a year. It's not just sort of like uh, right uh, January first. 
let's go and collect a hundred barn owls. No, they collect a um, hundred carcasses over the course of a year. So it is, and it's around the country and over the year as well. So, so realistic, yeah. So we need the probably need the agricultural sector to adopt calciferol and then give ourselves 24 months from them adopting it, um, properly adopting it, if they do properly adopt it, um, to to whatever it is. I mean, theoretically, you should start to see a drop in a couple of months, theoretically, because um, it, although it's degrading slowly over time by half-life, what you're doing is you're also topping it back up with all of that micro-dosing from the animals that they're eating. So, so long as you are not adding to it, it should drop at a predictable rate although it won't drop to zero it should stop start to drop by a predictable rate if you are not adding any more into the system so we'll start to see um measurable results within you know within that first year um but they won't be conclusive until you can put a couple of years data on top of that that's a really interesting point well let's let you know on that point i am going to cross my fingers and hope Hope to God that the um, the industry and the manufacturers can get them to adopt it because if it if it allows us to keep the escorts as a general, um, that would be that is a game changer. That yeah, if, yeah. If, because if, at the if, minute you know everyone knows we're going to lose them, don't they? Do you know what I mean? Like I think everyone's kind of just resolved themselves to the to the fact that it's not if we lose them it's when we we'll lose them so if we could get that back down and i, I think i think we've been I, th I think we've been preparing for that for for a, for a very long time um mm. and we are we've been running that knife edge for a long time it's just getting more and more real now um but i hope i mean fundamentally if used in the right way there's nothing wrong with the SCARs at all. The problem comes about is when they're not used in the right way. It's just a tool. It's, it's like anything else. You use a claw hammer in the wrong way uh, and you could really, you know, upset someone's day. Uh, if you use it the right way, you can put a picture up on the wall. Um, it's just it's just a tool, but it's a dangerous tool. And if it's not treated as a dangerous tool, as a lot of people don't seem to appreciate, that's when we have those problems. And and, and it's, it's the same with anything that we use, you know, I, I'm sure you're aware. Even snap traps, even snap traps are not infallible when it comes to causing damage to non-target animals. It, environmental management, for Christ's sake, which you think is going to be the lowest of the risks, you you alter the environment sufficiently, you are going to start excluding um, other animals from that environment, which will have a knock on, which will have a knock on. It's all back to that: the maximum impact for the minimum cost, uh, which can be achieved at every level, so long as we are smart and apply our skills that we've learned over the last five years <laughs> which we, yeah we, we can do it Palmer. we can't do we it can. there's no getting around it. we can do it we can um, we can that's the thing hey yeah so thank you very much for your time any last it's, thoughts before i go uh yeah but, but just my last thoughts are everyone who watches this take it on board don't don't just throw away what we've spent so long um, learning and, you know, don't see the last five years as um, some trial or tribulation that you had to put yourself through to get to a point where it's easy run. No, just take that information and add, it's your value added to anything, any conversation you have. It's the ability to be able to overcome any situation with any tool that you're given um, and make sure that you use all of them. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time on a Sunday. What are you doing this afternoon? Anything, nothing? Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to be preparing for the uh, 1EMV Roadshow on Wednesday, just uh, polishing up my talk. It's, a, it's, a, it's at their new uh, facility up in uh, West Yorkshire. Sheffield. I, I, I can give you the postcode yeah, if you like. Yeah, um, yeah. My, my geography is not not great. It's the uh, Yorkshire, Yorkshire Business Centre. Something along the lines of that. Yeah, that is. Um... I'm sure your representative will give you a more accurate address than I. I am simply turning up uh, to to talk about. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. It's a game. It's something completely different. It's either going to be very good fun or an absolute flop. So we'll see on the day how that yeah, turns. Out. It just it just says um, free to attend event at its new premises in West Yorkshire on Wednesday, April twenty sixth. Um, the event will feature interesting and educational talks from some of the industry's leading experts. You could be you. About your industry needs you. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, I, I need the stovepipe hat now, don't I? Yeah, um, no professionals. Five CPD points for attending. None of which from my talk. Don't you worry about it. There'll be nothing educational there. No, there will be. Uh, lovely stuff. Oh, hang on a second. Oh, yeah. Still doesn't give us the address. It says, uh, got to register. Um, oh, there we go. The event will be held at Kite Yorkshire Business Centre, Great North Road, Darrington, Pontefract, WFA 3 HR. If anyone wants to pop along and see Alex and have a natter with them, you will be there. Um, yeah. Tell you what is good, though. I'm looking at the people who support it and um, you're like playing with the big boys, aren't you? I am. Don't know how I've done that. So <laughs> something Who's must Veritas? have slipped through the crap some crack somewhere. Who's Veritas? Oh, that's Paul Westgate. Ah. Yeah. Right. So yourself and Paul are playing alongside of Envu um deadline, which is rental, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um Pelgar, Syngenta, and the BPCA. Yeah. Not bad Thank going, you. is it? Yeah, you've done well. You've done well. You're getting there, Alex. You're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly but surely, people... One step at a time. All right, mate. Have a lovely day and I'll catch you in a bit. God bless. See you in a bit.